finish education and you're here for meditation Mondays. And we're gonna begin with this lovely chant. Ain od mil vado ain od mil vado adonai uha elohim ay 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 ain od mil vado ain od Mihil vado Adonai, uha Elohim, ay, 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 enod. Mihil vado enod, mihil vado Adonai, Uha Elohim, ay 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 enod, mihil vado enod, mihil vado adonai, uha Elohim. I, 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 join me. La, 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 Ya la 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 Ya la 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 ya la la Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Eno Mi va do Eno Mi
and in the state that we find ourselves in right now after that introductory music and chanting. So let's keep ourselves in the state of openness, in the state of accepting Adonai Hua Elohim, Adonai and Elohim are all one, what that might mean. And I'll read to you some selections from Rabbi Harold Schulweis, who wrote a beautiful book called For Those Who Can't Believe, Overcoming the Obstacles to Faith. This book has been quite transformative in my own thinking. And here are some of his words to contemplate. And should you want to do it with your eyes closed or your gaze unfocused, let the words seep straight into your cells, straight into your body. As you take deep, regular breaths, just let yourself relax, feeling comfort wherever you're sitting, however you're sitting, sinking into the chair, sinking into your body, feeling your body so that you get out of your mind and you're able to focus on these words. Divinity includes both the reality principle of Elohim and the ideality principle of Adonai, the realm of is and the realm of ought are interdependent. They are not to be split asunder. Adonai and Elohim are one indivisible and interdependent, though they must be distinguished from each other. What does that mean? He writes, the God term Elohim first appears in the opening chapter of Genesis. In this chapter dealing with creation, the name Elohim is used exclusively. Elohim refers to the God of creation, the God of nature, the ground of natural laws. Elohim is the cause of the world as it is. Elohim is the God of the reality principle, the way things are, not the way things ought to be. The God of the laws of physical gravitation, not the laws of moral revelation. The rabbis had a seminal idea that the world pursues its natural course, and they describe it in the following way. Suppose a man stole a measure of wheat and went and sowed it in the ground. It would surely be right that the wheat should not grow since he stole it, but the world pursues its natural course. Further, supposing a man has intercourse with his neighbor's wife, it would surely be right that she should not conceive, but the world pursues its natural course. And this is taken from the Babylonian Talmud, Avodah Zarah 54b. We know what is right, we know what is fair, but the world of nature is no court of justice. Were the world of nature truly governed by judgments upon our moral behavior, Every natural event would be an ethical verdict. An earthquake would be a juridical sentence. A drought would be a punishment. A rainfall would be a reward. Cancer would flow from a divine decision. But nature, which is traceable to Elohim, is morally neutral and offers no guide for human emulation. Nature neither validates nor prohibits thievery or adultery. Agriculture and procreation are indifferent to matters of legitimacy. From the events of nature, we cannot infer the morality or immorality of those affected, or the outcome of natural events from the moral character of people. Elohim rules impartially. Elohim governs with moral neutrality. Elohim is the ground of being, or in the language of the liturgy, our prayer service, the life of the world. 
the energy of the universe. Towards events over which we have no control, Elohim is the wisdom of acceptance. I'll repeat that. Towards events over which we have no control, Elohim counsels a wisdom of acceptance. But the face of Elohim reveals only part of the persona of divinity. Adonai is the other half. Adonai moves us to transform the givenness of nature that sometimes weighs heavily upon us. If the counsel of Elohim leads to acceptance, the urgings of Adonai call for transformation. While there are many circumstances beyond our control, there are within our power attitudes and conduct that respond to human tragedy. We cannot change the past, but we can profoundly affect the future. The name of Adonai first appears when the human being is introduced in Genesis. Adonai, the source of transformation, is brought into play after the human being is charged to till and tend in the Garden of Eden. Up to this point, nature does not work to its capacities, both because the rain hasn't fallen and because the human being has not yet prepared the soil. Only when the human and non-human elements are combined are the names of Elohim and Adonai conjoined. So we quote, such is the story of heaven and earth when they were created. When the Lord God made heaven and earth, when no shrub of the field was yet on earth and no grasses of the field had yet sprouted because the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no human to till the soil, but a flow would well up from the ground and water the whole surface of the earth. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth. God blew into its nostrils the breath of life. And Adam became a living being. Not until humanity is joined with nature is the name of Adonai introduced and joined to Elohim. So we see in Torah the words Adonai Elohim. If Elohim relates to the whole of amoral nature, Adonai relates to that which human nature may do to control and repair nature. Elohim is the source of the powers of nature, but Adonai is the ground of moral goodness. Divinity includes both the reality principle of Elohim and the ideality principle of Adonai. The realm of is and the realm of ought are interdependent. They are not to be split asunder. Adonai and Elohim are one, indivisible and interdependent, though they must be distinguished from each other. Acceptance and transformation are basic responses to life rooted in the dual character of divinity. The daunting test of faith lies in determining when acceptance is appropriate and when it is premature. When are we to turn to Elohim and when are we to turn to Adonai? To cope with life spiritually is to know which events to accept and which events to transcend and transform. So now what I'd like to ask everyone to do, if you have your eyes closed, I'd like you to gently begin to open them and I'd like to ask you for a bit of a writing exercise. And that writing exercise can be done in the chat function. So in the chat function, I'd like for you to write down either to everyone, or if you'd like it to be more private, you can write it just to me. 
when do you feel God in your life, in your day? When do you feel God? Now, if God is a problematic word for you, which it is for many, many people, please feel free to substitute divinity. When do you feel divinity? When do you feel awe, wonder? When do you feel connected to all? When do you feel oneness? When do you feel God? So I'll give you a moment to experience that, think about that question. All of creation is one. There is no separation. What we see is separate. This and that is our view at the outer level. The deeper level is one of unity. Shlemut, complete oneness. Some people experience this oneness through nature or awe, connectedness with family and friends, or even worshiping. Sometimes at life cycle events, very often at funerals, interesting. Or days like today when you might be looking out of your window or standing outside in nature and it's just glorious. Some people feel God all the time, always. Even in doubt, even at the lowest moment, sometimes people just feel that presence, which is a blessing. Hmm, feeling God in life when you are with children or grandchildren. Or, oh, what a beautiful image, just lying on your back in a water, right? Staring up at trees and sun and just kind of floating, right? That beautiful metaphor of floating in the world, which allows us to just sort of let life, let the world buoy us up without us having to exert so much energy the way we normally do. I, some people experience it when chanting Torah, like this incredible wave of inspiration coming through. So many different ways of experience divinity. Often at night, reciting prayers or feeling in nature that sense that God is everywhere and that closeness, saying the Shema very intently, looking into the eyes of someone else. So many people see in nature, in the sunset, the moon, all kinds of places, clouds, ah, and obviously life cycle events, and some of you are able, even during horrible environmental events, to really somehow perceive that power behind it all. The beauty of nature, the goodness of people, looking into the eyes of a newborn baby. And some people struggle to feel that presence, the presence of divinity, the presence of oneness or connectedness. For some people, that, that's a very difficult presence to be in touch with, to feel. And hopefully, through the work that we do in this meditation, through our moments of quiet, our moments of connection and training our minds, really, what is mindfulness? Let's remember, it's training our minds 
to be able to pay attention, to be fully present with what is the act of our focus, of our attention, and to do it in, with intensity, without distraction, with purpose, with kindness, and to try not to label things, not to add that meta thinking to it, but just to see it the way it is. Like kind of the way we're supposed to be on Shabbat, just letting things be. And to sustain that attention, to be in the present for as long as you can until inevitably your mind will take you out of it and draw you with a distraction away. And then you just simply bring your mind back, rachamim tashu, with mercy and compassion and loving kindness. To shuva, you just re return to the object of your focus time and time and time again. That is what mindful meditation or mindfulness in its essence is you try and approach the world with beginner's mind that open curiosity that allows us to see things as if for the very first time with the wonder that children have when they discover something new. and it's through this practice that we begin to feel again and again more connected with the world more rooted in the present, perhaps feeling a little bit more of that divinity, that awe and wonder, that sense of God in our lives. Clearly nature is definitely one of the things that provoke us to experience this, not surprisingly. Um, and now I'm gonna ask you to, again, Sit back, reconnect with your body as we go into another sort of guided meditational moment, sort of where we pursue thoughts as someone reads, as I read, letting our mind absorb them, downloading them in a kind of meditative way. And um, now I'm going to read to you from an amazing writer, thinker, author, Rabbi Arch Green. If you've never read any of his books, you really need to go online and find them and pick one and get started. He's just remarkable in the way he writes about modern Jewish theology, opening us up to think about our liturgy, our worship service, the way we speak about God in, in interpreting it in new, new and more current ways, perhaps more mystical ways. Rabbi Green is a scholar of Jewish mysticism. And he gave an address in 2016 to Spiritual Directors International. And um, I'm going to read to you from part of that address. And if you'd like, again, you can close your eyes, taking deep, satisfying breaths, Feeling yourself sink into your chair. Feeling your legs connecting with the chair, your back connecting with the chair. Softening your gaze or closing your eyes again. Reconnecting with breathing. What then do I mean when I speak of the love of God I understand God as the underlying oneness of being, the one that already existed in the unspeakable moment before the Big Bang, the one that was present in every bit of rock and gas that was spewed forth by it, the one that existed in the burning crust of this planet as it sets a course of revolutions around its sun this one exists within every life and non-living form that has evolved on our planet over these 13 or 18 billion years. 
It is Yud, He, Vav, He, as the Hebrew name indicates, which simply means being. All of past, present, and future existence artificially reified into a proper name that should really be rendered as is, was, will be, rather than God. This force of existence that coalesced into the pond of chemicals that came to constitute life has then existed in every life form that has come to be in our long step by natural selection step evolutionary journey because it has journeyed from the very simplest forms of life, one-celled creatures beneath the sea to the great complexity of the still mysterious human mind. You may say that it has an appreciation for complexity and diversity. Since it garbs itself in this coat of many forms and colors, I have every reason to assume that it delights in doing so. That delight energizing the constant push forward in this endless process of self-manifestation is rendered into our human emotional vocabulary as love. Thus we say that the one loves each form that it inhabits for the split second in evolutionary time it dwells within it, even you and me. Or to quote an earlier version of this story, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There is no task more urgent for all of our religious communities in the 21st century than that of revealing evolution for the sacred story that it is, helping humanity transform its relationship relationship with the natural we are entirely apart. If we fail at this, God may indeed be left with nothing, this time with a small n. Let me translate this mythoposis of evolution into the language of our liturgy, the spiritual setting within which much of my religious life takes place. Each morning and each evening, service opens with two blessings recited in order. One is a blessing to God for the wonders of creation, the great lights, the drama of day and night. Its central line is, God renews constantly, each day, the work of creation. The second blessing is that of love. With great love have you loved us, the house of Israel, giving us your teachings. I do not believe that God does anything different between these two blessings. The trees in the forest stretch upward to receive sunlight, converting its rays into the chlorophyll they need to exist. The sun stands as a metaphor for the divine light towards, towards nature stretches. That is the first blessing. We too stretch forth to receive that same light. We convert it into our chlorophyll. We call it love, the stuff of life, that which allows us to be as fully human as the tree is fully tree. That is the second blessing. Again, to be a religious person is to cultivate a heart open enough to receive that love and to reprocess it into love for those around us. To be a religious teacher, a Rebbe, a guide, for a spiritual director is to develop the mind, language, and listening heart to help others along the path to do so 
as well. That is the whole Torah spoken while standing on one foot. All the rest is commentary. Mm. Mm. And now, if you choose, you can either keep your eyes closed and imagine this, or you can open your eyes and look at the screen. Here you'll see the Hebrew letters Yud, Hey, Av, Hey. What Rabbi Green mentioned in his address is the name of God, the sacred personal name of God that we now pronounce as Adonai. But Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, as we've discussed before in previous sessions, simply when you pronounce these letters, sounds like breathing. Yeah. Was, is, will be. Was, is, will be. Being. And arranged vertically, if you look carefully, teachers have taught me to see within these letters and this arrangement and this whole world, word of being, the human form that we are embodiments of this divinity, that with the yud, we have the head and the neck erect at the top of our torso. And then we have the arms and the shoulders on either side, providing balance weight structure to the top of us. And then further down the vav of spine, of torso, of core, rooting down into our pelvis and legs. Again, splitting up into two halves, into two sides, balancing the upper and the lower. So that in essence, the human form is one aspect of the name of God written large on our bodies in the way we're structured. Walking, talking, breathing, heart pumping divinity, being was, is, will be, Adonai, living in the realm of both reality and aspiration, what is and what ought to be. And we embrace that. We feel that. We look at our hands. We look at our body. And our job, our purpose is to try and love ourselves in the same way that divinity loves us. We feel ourselves blessed. We feel ourselves grounded in the knowledge that we are connected to all that is, all that was, and all that will be, connected to this oneness, part of this glorious, everlasting reality that we call life, and find the love the love that we shower on plants and on pets and on grandchildren 
and on all of the things that we love to take even a tiny fraction of that love and turn it inward to self, knowing that by strengthening our own love of self, we strengthen our ability to bring love into the world. That the well of love from which we draw to serve others, to beautify this planet, needs to be replenished with the love that we show ourselves. The love that tells us deep in every cell of our body that we are lovable. We are loved. We are worthy of love because we are part of this divinity and we are part of this world of love. Our diversity, our differences, even our handicaps, our weaknesses, our faults and our flaws, all of that is part of the multiplicity and diversity of life itself. That God, divinity, oneness, yeah, delights in and celebrates each moment, each day, each year, each century, each millennia and on and on. We are part of something extraordinary and we are blessed to know, to be conscious of the fact that we are part of something extraordinary. And that feeling, that feeling of blessing, that consciousness of knowing the extraordinary should make our heart swell with the knowledge that we are loved by an unending love. We have been given this world this beauty, this nature, and this wisdom tradition, all as a result of love. We are loved by an unending love. Now, I'd like to ask you to keep your eyes closed and to continue to focus on that love as we practice a few moments of focused meditation with sound as the object. I'm going to play for you a forest bird song. And really, our only goal here is to immerse ourselves in the sound of the birds. So much so that we begin to be able to differentiate one bird call from another and begin to hear patterns and begin to hear the conversation that's taking place. That incredible focus to be able to hear the bird calls is the goal and the mindfulness meditation that we seek to practice for perhaps the next 10 or so moments.
We slowly come back to ourselves as we come back into our bodies. And we conclude with one final poem by David Wagner from his collected in new poems called Traveling Light. And this poem is entitled Lost. Stand still, the trees ahead and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here, and you must treat it as a powerful stranger, must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes, listen, it answers, I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying, here. No two trees are the same to the raven. No two branches are the same to the wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still, the forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much for participating in our Meditation Mondays. And I look forward to seeing you and hearing you and reading you all next week. Have a marvelous, wonderful week and a wonderful Shabbat. Take care and um, happy Mother's Day to everybody who are mothers or adopted mothers and have mothers in their lives. So Shabbat Shalom and happy Mother's Day in advance. Take care. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. Yes. Thank you, Rabbi. It was a great Thank you.